Chair of the House's committee uh, investigating the January 6 hearings, they've brought to light how members of former President Trump's cabinet discussed the possibility of invoking the 25th Amendment. That 25th Amendment is to remove a sitting president from office. Former Defense Secretary Mark Esper is out with a new book. It's called A Sacred Oath, Memoirs of a Secretary of Defense During Extraordinary Times. In it, he describes how the assault on the Capitol was not the first time top officials had considered using the 25th Amendment. Secretary Esper joins us now to talk more about his book and today's hearing. Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you again. Thanks. Great to be with you both. All right. So you write that former President Trump did not, did not meet the threshold for invoking the 25th Amendment at any point prior to the 2020 election. Uh, do you believe that to be true, seeing his behavior after the election and on January 6th? Well, you're right about the first point. You know, I saw some really bad behavior from the president, uh, things that most people would clearly disagree with, but nothing that rose to the level of the 25th Amendment. And I'm not a, a scholar on the amendment, but it talks about being incapacitated. So I, I never saw anything like that. Um, and it's hard to speak to events after the fact, because again, I wasn't there to observe the president and what was going on. But the fact that uh, what the January 6th committee uh, hearing raised the other night, that Betsy DeVos raised this issue, uh, that maybe uh, others in the cabinet had raised this issue, gives me and probably many others a moment to pause to think, what did they experience? What did they see that caused them beyond obviously the tragic events of January 6th, but what did they see, experience with him that prompted that concern? Um, as, as you point out, you were no longer the defense secretary on January 6th. Um, but I'm curious what you were thinking and feeling as you watched the attack on the Capitol that day. Oh, look, it, it was terrible, a tragic. I write about this in, in my book. It was so saddening and, and maddening. And, you, you know, it was my first tweet I ever put out as a private citizen that afternoon to say, that uh, what, what happened was uh, appalling and un-American. It was illegal. It was inspired by partisan misinformation. I wrote all that uh, that afternoon because I was so uh, overcome uh, by the events of that day to, to consider the fact that the, you know, the Capitol was not just uh, attacked, but attacked by our fellow Americans. We hadn't seen a, an attack on the Capitol since 1814, and of course, an insurrection since the Civil War. So it's just very tragic. And I think the key thing that I wanna see coming out of these hearings, one of one of several, is what are we doing to prevent this in the future going forward? Uh, any challenge, first of all, to the electoral count, but any other preventive measures that we that need to be considered by Congress? Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, in your book, you describe uh, and you talk about some really frightening and, and frankly unbelievable revelations about former President Trump. For example, you point out in the book that the president wanted to launch cruise missiles into the sovereign state of Mexico to stop the flow of drugs into the United States. And when he proposed that to you, obviously you had to explain to him all the rational and logical sane reasons why that wasn't possible. Um, you ultimately were removed from the administration because you refu refused to put U.S. troops uh, on American soil uh, during the protests that happened in and around the White House. Um, you know, but, and I asked, I, we talked a little bit about this in the green room of our morning show when you were uh, here uh, last month. Um, what do you say to those critics who believe that some of these revelations that you write about in your book could have done more good if you had spoken out, if you had spoken out sooner? And I know that you feel that mm -hmm. if you had been, if you had left earlier, if you decided to do that while you were still in the administration, who knows how far things could have gone off the rails. But, but just talk to those critics who wonder for you and a lot of others who are now writing these books on their time in the administration, um, why didn't all of you, it seems that there are a lot of people now writing books, all of you felt the same way, why not together as a cabinet, as an administration say, here's what's going on? Well, look, first of all, it's, it's a fair question to ask. I wrestled with this during most of my tenure. I talk about this in the first five, six pages of my book of this dilemma and how I wrestled with it, you know, what's better for the country for me to stay or for me to go? And at the end of the, at the end of the line, I, what I came up with was it's better for me to stay. I could do more good inside the administration, advancing important initiatives in the Pentagon, but at the same time, blunting or reshaping or pushing back on bad ideas. And so when people raise this, I say, well, look, if you didn't like uh, Stephen Miller's idea of sending a quarter million troops to the border in the spring, I could resign then, but I wouldn't have been there weeks later to push back on President Trump's idea of attacking Mexico with missiles. 
And if you thought I should resign then, then I wouldn't have been there on January, I'm sorry, on June 1st to push back on deployment of active duty troops in the streets of America. And if you didn't like that, I wouldn't have been there. You know, the story goes on and on and on. I thought given the singular importance of my unique role as Secretary of Defense, where I'm one of only two people, the president being the other, that has the authority to deploy military forces, I felt the best thing for the country was for me to stay and grind it out. Because look, let me tell you, it would have been far easier for me and my family to step aside and resign. It would have been a two day media hit and that's it. And then you would have had president install his loyalists like he did on November 9th uh, when I was fired from office and they would have had run of show for two months. And I say to folks too, look, if you didn't like the last two months of the Pentagon uh, of the administration, uh, think about what it might've been like if they had eight months to, to uh, you know, execute some of these outlandish ideas. Mm. Um, you, you said that one of the things that you hope comes out of the January 6th committee is, you know, some sort of list of recommendations to ensure that nothing like this happens again. After hearing the, uh, after listening to the first hearing, it was clear that um, if a list of recommendations is one of the things they're going to do, it's just one of the things. It really sounded mm. like we were hearing opening arguments in a criminal case. That, uh, that prime time hearing. So I want to ask you, do you think that former President Trump could face charges from the Justice Department based on your knowledge and some of the things that you witnessed? You know, it's, it's a legal question and I'm not trying to dodge it, but I don't know the law well enough to, uh, to, to know if there's a statute that prescribes exactly what he did. And we need to see exactly what the case they lay out. But clearly, uh, you know, politically, he he should be held to account for what happened. I spoke about this again on the day. I think I, one of the things I tweeted with and have said repeatedly since then is there needs to be accountability. We need to begin with transparency. We need to understand exactly what happened, who the key players were, what they said and what they did and, and didn't do, by the way. And hopefully we'll find that out over the next week or so. And then there needs to be accountability. And, uh, you know, ultimately it'll be the decision, I guess, of, of the Department of Justice to determine uh, what might happen on a on a legal basis, and then of course the the political um, the, the political uh, context is happening right ha now in terms of political repercussions. And I I hope that more Americans, particularly Republicans, will come around to realize that it was a free and fair election. It doesn't mean there weren't maybe issues here and there, but it was a free and fair election. Joe Biden won. Uh, Donald Trump lost, and that we needed to have a, 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 a peaceful transition office. Because in my view, look, there are two hallmarks of a republic, of a functioning democracy. One is a free and fair election, and second is the peaceful transition of power. And, and those things have been challenged and continue to be challenged, at least the first. And we need to get beyond that. We need to convince our fellow Americans that we have a legitimate president in office and move forward and look ahead. So based on that assertion, uh, Mr. Secretary, and you look, you've been serving your country uh, since you were a plebe at the United States Military Academy. Uh, you know what the, uh, the, the, the oath that you swore to the Constitution of the United States means. You just described what could potentially be a threat to our democracy. Given that the former president continues to suggest that the 2020 election was rigged, given that he, anytime he encounters an election that doesn't go his way, he tells his supporters that the election was rigged. Do you believe that President Trump, former President Trump, is a threat to our democracy. Oh, look, I, I've said this uh, before, yes. I mean, if you look back when you take into account for nearly two months and, and to this day continues to undermine the election and say that it was false, when he, when he summoned his supporters, his most radical supporters to D.C. on January 6th, when he, when he incited them that, that morning and then failed to call them off that afternoon, all those reasons give you uh, no no other conclusion to draw, but that he's a, a threat to the democracy in the terms of the not just the laws, but the norms and conventions by which uh, all previous presidents have honored our elections and the and the customs by which our functioning, well functioning democracy has uh, has endured for over 240 years. All right, Mark Esper, thank you very much. Thank you both.